next speaker is a graduate of Doctor of Medicine at the Pamantasan ng Lungsod ng Maynila, Intramuros, and graduated with a GWA of 2.05 and ranked seventh among 81 students. She had her res residency training in radiology at National Kidney and Transplant Institute and fellowship in CTMRI at the same institution. She is a fellow of Philippine College of Radiology and CTMRI Society of the Philippines. She is currently radiolog a radiology consultant of the Pangasinan Provincial Hospital and El Gura General Hospital and Universal Health General Hospital. Let us now welcome our next speaker, Dr. Lalaine Olivar Molinawe. Good day, everyone. Um, thank you, PUA Pindanao Chapter, for inviting me to be one of your resource speakers. So this is Euro Radiology Hacks. So we, including my husband, who's also a radiologist, actually had a hard time um, doing this lecture because the topic cannot be lifted from any textbooks. Because of this, majority of um, the cases here are from our own personal experiences and um, cases will be included in the discussion. <clears throat> so I had my residency and fellowship training, um, CDMRI at the National Kidney and Transplant Institute. As you can see here, we have our own separate diagnostic center building. The Department of Radiology shares this building with the emergency room, oncology, radio, radiation therapy, and some offices, as well as the PET CT scan. Um, in our department, we do an average of about um, 200 to 300 x-rays daily. 80 to 120 ultrasound, 30 to 50 CT scans, 10 to 20 MRI, 20 to 30 um, IR procedures, interventional radiology procedures. The department is called um, the Department of Medical Imaging and Therapeutic, um, Therapeutic Radiology. As early as our first year in training, apart from basic radiography and ultrasound. We are trained to do ultrasound guided procedures such as thoracentesis and paracentesis. As we become more senior, we got to do um, nephrostomy tube insertion guidance together with our urologist and kidney biopsy together with the nephrologist. So a little overview of the topic which I divided into different modalities that we use in radiology. Um, radiology hacks in x-ray, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, and interventional radiology. So let's start. First, euro hack in x-rays. Is x-ray considered a relic or is it still reliable? At this day and age, we're always leading to ultrasounds or even CD scan, right? But x-rays are still very useful. It's affordable, it's quick, and it has a lesser radiation dose compared to CD scan. The American College of Radiology lists at least 16 indications for KUB or abdominal x-ray. Of the majority of it are for GI diseases, indications relevant to your practice include the following. Um, evaluation of evaluation and follow-up of urinary tract calculi, including assessment of little tripsy patients, monitoring of EJ stents, and scalp field prior to procedure. Here is a KB x-ray where in there is a DJ stent. And in the lower, inferior aspect of the DJ stent are um, some hyper hyperdensities, which are likely infestations. 
upon removal of the stem and the pearl, and frustrations are seen in its inferior aspect. Now, what do you order? An abdominal x ray or a KB x ray? Is there a difference? Yes, there's a slight difference. In an, in an abdominal x ray, the technologist, the radiographer, will try to get the entire hemidiaphragm as its superior aspect. And if it's an KUB x ray, the renal, um, the pelvic cavity will be, the entire pelvic cavity will be seen in its inferior aspect. So, in here, the, um, the picture on your left is an abdominal x ray. As you can see, uh, the hemidiaphragm is seen it's in its entirety, in its superior aspect. In KUB x ray, in the middle portion, the entire pelvic region can be seen. If you have a small pediatric patient in a single film, the entire um, hemidiaphragm can be taken and this pelvic region can be seen in one film. So if you want to focus on the pelvic region, you should request for a KUB x-ray and not an abdominal x-ray. What if you don't have an access to a CT scan? Remember, the IDP or the intravenous pyelography. Some of the young people out here may, um, may not know this procedure anymore. During my training, I think I, I've had only 10 patients. Um, I've assisted in 10 patients for uh, KUB IVP. So nice to know that we can do this in our department. It's becoming more and more obsolete. However, it's still useful and affordable. In this patient, we can see that the, pelvic, the uh, right pelvic calyx is dilated with a filling defect in the middle aspect, likely due to a ureteral calyx. Moving on to the next modality, which is Eurohax in ultrasound. In doing the kidney ultrasound, the kidneys is a retroperitoneal organ. Therefore, we can see it through the back. After evaluation of the patient in the supine position, we can ask them to do a lateral decubitus position for better view or for better examination of the kidneys. Now, how do we diagnose a nephrolithiasis? We diagnose a calculi or a nephrolithiasis if two of the following characteristics are shown. There is an echogenic focus with an acoustic shadowing exhibiting or if it exhibits twinkle artifact on color doppler or comet tail artifact. Not all echogenic focus on ultrasound are calculi. There are mimics of nephrolithiasis on ultrasound, and this includes vascular calcification, early medullary nephrocalcinosis, medullary sponge kidneys, infections, medullary fibrosis, intravenal gases, and milk of calcium cyst. For example, this is a KAB x-ray of 45-year-old female who has been diagnosed with a middle caliceal calculus since 2018 and is routinely monitored. Um, so I end up, um, I ended up with the ultrasound of the patient, which revealed a cystic focus with an echogenic focus. However, the echogenic focus has no clear posterior echogenic uh, posterior acoustic shadowing. If you ask this patient to do a lateral decubitus position. 
these echogenic focus will actually move or layer because this echogenic focus is not a nephrolithiasis, it is not a calculi, it is a milk of calcium cyst. Now, we move on to hero radiology hacks in CT scan. CT scan is the modality of choice in the evaluation of blunt renal injury. So this is an actual case of my husband. He did a few weeks ago. He was called for the for a fast ultrasound of a 24-year-old male, vehicular accident, riding a motorcycle, yeah, hitting the fender of an SUV. Um, fast ultrasound was done. So this is the kidney. Does it look normal? Yes, it looks normal. So, ultrasound was done, which only revealed minimal pelvic ascites in the background of a gassy abdomen. The following day, the patient um, experienced difficulty of breathing. There was vague abdominal pain. The abdomen was um, more tense, and there was decreasing amount of bin. X lap was done, which actually revealed a shattered kidney and approximately one liter of hemorrhagoperitone. So, with this, um, for blunt abdominal trauma, it is best to do a CT scan. Do we do it um, with contrast, or will plain will a plain study suffice? It actually depends on the urgency and. With a clinical picture of the patient. Conscious study will give us more information, more extent of the injury, such as ureteral injury. CT scan is better in evaluating the retroperitoneum as compared to the ultrasound. Next case, um, 34-year-old female who came in for a right for a right flank pain, 8, of, 8 over 10. Is it a renal colic pain? During the past decade, unenhanced CT scan has become the standard of reference in the detection of urinary calculi. Owing to its high sensitivity, approximately 95% and specificity, approximately 98% in the setting. However, numerous diseases uh, may manifest as acute flank pain and may mimic urolithiasis. Up to a third of an enhanced CT scan performed because of flank pain may reveal unsuspected findings related to stone diseases, but will eventually may help explain the patient's condition. Alternative diagnoses are most commonly related to gynecological conditions, especially adnexal masses, non-stone genitourinary diseases such as pyelonephritis, renal neoplasm, and closely followed by GI diseases, appendicitis, diverticulitis. Hepatobiliary, vascular, musculoskeletal conditions may be also be, may also be encountered. Vascular causes of acute flank pain must always be considered since these are life-threatening emergency that may require the intravenous administration of contrast material for adequate diagnosis. We must be familiar with the typical findings of urinary stone diseases at unenhanced CT scan as well as the spectrum of alternative diagnosis that may be detected with this modality to adequately diagnose the source of flank pain. So in this patient, female patient who presented with right flank pain, um, the cause of it is a very large right ovarian cyst. Next modality, Eurohax and MRI. So what if you have a pregnant patient who is complaining of a left flank pain? Ultrasound 
is unremarkable. What do we do next? We can do MRI urogram. In the study of Regan et al., MRI is able to correctly detect the level of obstruction in 100% of the cases. And um, MR urography is able to show the cause of obstruction 13 seconds within the study. This is actually a normal urogram. It is fast and accurate. No need for contrast. It has no radiation, therefore safe for a pregnant patient. However, it is more expensive and it's not readily available. So I think I'm coming to the end of my lecture. Um, we go on to uroradiology hacks in interventional radiology. So here in the Philippines for prostate biopsies, we actually we usually do ultrasound guidance doing at least 12 cores, hoping to hit the lesion. So Pokorni reported that in primary biopsy setting, MRI-guided in-bore biopsy resulted in an increase in the overall detection rate of intermediate and high-risk prostate cancers when compared to the standard um, transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy. This is an image, sagittal section, showing an MR-guided in-bore biopsy using MRI-compatible needle guide and needles. Here is an algorithm proposed by urologist Dr. Peter Swindle. So if there is an elevated PSA, it is best to have an MRI of the prostate to best evaluate that whether there is a targetable lesion causing it. And based in its location or an accessibility, we can decide if it is best to do an, uh, a transrectal biopsy if the lesion is large and peripheral, and if it's small and anterior, then an MRI-guided biopsy can be done instead. However, in reality, um, in the Philippine setting, this technology is still not readily available. It is a very expensive setup. Um, I don't know if it's being done here in the Philippines. And so we go back to the traditional trans-ultrasound-guided um, prostate biopsy. The radiologist, we try to target we try to target the hypoechoic peripheral areas. However, sometimes the prostate gland appears as a homogeneous structure. And all you can do are random biopsies. That's why we do a 12-core biopsy. Um, I would just like to mention about the role of um, PET scan in prostate cancer since now there are more PET scans available and this is becoming a great tool in the oncology practice. It is gaining ground on initial screening, especially in cases with low PSA levels, and it's used in staging purposes. Types of PET scan tracer available include the Axumin, FDG, and the PSMA, or the prostate-specific mem membrane antigen. Here uh, at NKTI, I think um, they use um, the PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen. So that ends my lecture. So what are the key points? In diagnostic, the most expensive imaging test does not always mean it is the best. We radiologists are technology driven and we are technology dependent. And I think the best hack that I can tell you, I can tell everyone is that don't hesitate 
to ask your friendly radiologist for help. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for watching.